Amen. So here, there, on the radio, online, take your Bible out. Let's open them to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 11 in a Bible study that I've entitled, By Faith, Sarah and Abraham Waited on God. By faith, Sarah and Abraham waited on God. We learned last time that Abraham is one of the greatest examples of faith in the Bible. The three major world religions, I could say two religions and the the true relationship with Jesus Christ, pay great respect to Abraham. And why? Because he believed against all odds and endured in his faith. He possessed an obedient, believing, persevering faith. And I think if Abraham, Abraham teaches us anything, he teaches us that we must all have a personal relationship with God. Today, a personal relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. I mean, you think of Abraham living his life as a pagan in the middle of the, uh, of the Ur of the Chaldeans. And God, the Bible says, spoke to him. And he heard. There was some kind of connection with Abraham and God already to be able to discern and recognize the voice of God. Not only to discern and recognize the voice of God, but to act upon it with his entire life. And Abraham had a personal relationship with God. And it's important for us to recognize our relationship is not with a church and it's not with a pastor and it's not with a movement and it's not with a denomination. It's not because of our parents or our grandparents. We all have to have a personal relationship with God. It's not any other way. The only way of salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Abraham, remember, was called from a very safe and comfortable place. His life was disrupted by the voice of God. And here we are living in a time where our lives are being disrupted by circumstances. Our lives are being severely disrupted. And when our lives are disrupted, it is a call from God for us to respond in faith that we might trust God over the things that we don't control. And if there's anything that Abraham learned and there's anything that we're learning is that so much is outside of our control. So what do we do when things are outside of our control? We listen closely for the voice of God and obey him. That's how faith is lived out. Faith without works is dead. And so the response for us is to match our faith with corresponding works like Abraham did. And today, we meet his wife. And I want to suggest to you an important part of the character of Sarah that isn't really mentioned in, verse, in chapter 11. Let's read it through first in verse 11. And then I want to reveal something in it, the depth of Sarah here that may or may not be seen so readily. Notice in verse 11 of Hebrews 11, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. Now let me just fill you in. Past the age, we know how old she was. She was 90 years old when she had her baby, Isaac. 90, not 19, not 29, 90. Can you imagine having a kid at 90 years old? There's a word for that, it's called impossible. It's impossible. This is an impossibility that was matched by faith because it was promised by God. And that's the same way it works with us today. There's an impossibility that's matched with the promise of God and our faith to believe that promise no matter what we see. And there was a long time before the promise came. But at 90 years old, not only was it like a practical, like not only was it a practical impossibility, but she literally did not have what it took inside of her to conceive a child. It was God that did the work inside her womb. She was 90, do you get that number, 90? And notice, the faith was based on, at the end of verse 11, she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born many of the stars of the sky and the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. I don't know if you've ever, maybe at the reservoir, but you've been to the beach, you get just a, just get a palm full of sand, just a palm, and try to count each of the grains. You're going to lose count pretty quickly. It's all going to move, it's going to shift, and just trying to count the sea, the, the, the grains in your own little palm, but can you imagine just looking up and down the beach thinking, man, my descendants are going to be more than just this little beach or every beach everywhere around the world. This was a monumental promise that we're going to get to in a moment in Genesis 
But this one man, because of the faith of Sarah, he connects the promise of God to Abraham's descendants to the faith of Sarah. She's a very important part of God's will for, for you and for me. You could say today that you and I are followers of Jesus Christ because of the faith of Sarah. I know Abraham gets a lot of attention, but Sarah in the shadows had just as much faith. And together, they are finding themselves following God. So Sarah, it says, because of her faith, she has a baby. Then the promise is fulfilled. And then there's a little parenthesis in verse 13 where it says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Abraham and Sarah never saw this. They saw Isaac, but they didn't see the, the fulfillment of all the descendants. Uh, and it's still happening today. They didn't get to see it, but notice, not having, but having seen them afar off with eyes of faith, they were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have op had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Then jump back to verse 10. Abraham waited for that city which founda has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is a fascinating thing. And, you know, with Abraham, we can kind of get the sense that he followed God because he heard God's voice, and he says, okay, God, I'm ready to go. But I want you to consider that Sarah did not get a heavenly visitation by God in that original call. It came to Abraham. Abraham's the one that heard the voice, and he's the one that left. Sarah was in a different place. Sarah had to believe God, and she exercised that by also believing her husband. Now, that's pretty huge. She had to trust that God was speaking to her husband. And, and that speaks to depth of integrity because there are times in our lives where God will bring us to a place in our marriage, in our friendships, in our relationships, in our church family, where we have to place our trust in someone that they are truly hearing from God. And I have to say that a lot of marriages are upside down today. A lot of ladies specifically, let's speak of it in the context of Sarah here. A lot of women, a lot of wives today have a hard time trusting their husbands. And because they're having a hard time trusting their husbands, they have a hard time trusting the Lord. Or you could put it this way, they have a hard time trusting God. And so therefore they have a hard time trusting their husbands. Hey, let's face it. Many times it's because a husband is not leading the home as God has instructed you. You are not being the man, the godly spiritual man of your home. And so you make it harder for your wives to trust you and for your wives to trust God because of what you've heard or what you've received. You make it harder. And it's not exclusive. We're taking the wives to the husbands here because that's the context, but it's also the other way around. A lot of division in our homes, a lot of division in our friendships, a lot of division in the church has to do with not being able to trust God enough to trust the people in our lives. To have that confirmation of the Holy Spirit, that my spirit bears witness with his spirit, that the direction that a pastor's taking, a direction that a leader's taking, or in this case, this is monumental. This is a life-altering decision that's being made. And Sarah not only trusted God, but she trusted her husband. And that encourages me, and it should encourage you. It's very possible for you to be able to trust God enough to trust your spouse, to trust your friends, to move forward in obedience to the Lord. Let's go back to Genesis for a moment. Genesis chapter 13. Let's look at this unfolding of the promise, and then let's find where Sarah comes in where Hebrews 11:11 11, 11 addresses directly. In Genesis 13, we have the episode between Abram and his nephew Lot as they're heading out, wandering around. And I wanna give you the highlights of it instead of reading it straight through. But you'll notice as in verse one, it says Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with them, they started heading to the south. They built an altar, they're, they're moving through, they have a lot of livestock, it says, and then you jump to verse five, Lot also, who went with Abram, Abram, he had a lot of flocks and herds and tents. They were both very prosperous. And in verse six it says, the land was not able to support them 
that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Now, this is a neat encouragement just for a moment because sometimes people associate faith with, well, you know, I just have to sell everything and I've got to walk barefoot through Aurora and Denver the rest of my life to preaching the gospel if I'm going to be that man and that woman of faith. But this is an example of Abram and Lot. And you know that Lot had struggles in his faith right now, in his relationship, because he, instead of, instead of yielding, as we'll see in a moment, to Abram, he chooses for himself and he makes a big, big, big mistake for his family that he's going to pay for the rest of his life. Still a man of faith, still a man that loves God, but made a lot of mistakes that he's not going to recover from. But these are two men that were men full of faith, and God blessed them by grace with a lot of possessions and a lot of money. Not everybody has that, but some people do. And just because you have a lot doesn't mean that you don't have faith. It's just a temptation, isn't it? To trust in what you have and instead of trusting in the Lord. And it's just a temptation. But they have every, it's, a life of faith doesn't mean God won't trust you with stuff. But if God does trust you with stuff, if he does trust you with a lot of money, if he does trust you with a lot of possessions, make sure that they, you realize they belong to him and are to be used for him for his glory. It's all his stuff anyway. We just have it on loan. It doesn't belong to us. God owns everything. So check this out. It says now in verse 7, we know in 6 the land's not able to support them. And then it said verse 7, there was strife. You might want to mark that word, strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. So the enemies are in the land, warfare is up ahead, difficulties all around them, and what happens? They're, the people that work for them are starting to argue among, among one another, and there's strife. And that strife between the people are going to come into Lot and Abram's life. As you notice here in the very next verse, so Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. So I want to pause here for a moment and I want to speak to this because you need to understand something. Strife with other people is a, par a normal part of life. Strife with other people is a normal part of life. It is a normal part of life for the Christian, for the believer. I wouldn't be surprised if you watching online, listening on the radio, those that might be here, that you haven't had strife with someone in this church. That there may not have been some issue of strife. It is normal and common. It's unfortunate. In my life, I'd like less of it, but there's always strife in our lives. And I don't know if you've noticed in Abram and Lot's issue, this is how strife often happens. You've got person A and you've got person B, and they're getting along just fine until person C, a mutual friend or a mutual acquaintance, they get start up something and now if you look at some of the strife you're in, most of your strife actually isn't with the other person. It's because of a third person. It's somebody else. And let me, let me illustrate it further. This happens a lot in families where you've got parents that are just going along, enjoying life, yay, 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 and then their kid does something. And when their kids does something, husband wants, dad wants to do one thing, wife wants to do another thing, and now what happens? Strife between parents. It was the kid that did it. But now they're strife. No, I want to do this. No, she, we should do this. No, you're too harsh. No, you're too kind. And before you know it, before you know it, the, the kid's getting away with whatever he did and you're arguing for the next week and one of you, most likely the guy, sleeping on the couch. There you are. And what happened? And it doesn't have to be a little kiddo. I, I kind of point to a little kiddo. It could be your adult kids causing strife. And it's actually not between you two. It's because of a third party. You say, Ed, how do you know so much about that? Well... That's how I grew up. I don't know. I, wasn't, you know. I didn't get saved till later in life. I don't know how I figured this out. I really don't. But I do know as a very young age, I figured out as a kid, because I was a rotten kid to begin with, and I figured out that I could get my parents to disagree about me. And if I could get them fighting, I would get away with everything. And I did pretty much most of my life, which got me in more trouble and more trouble. And I, I, I felt I had to apologize to my parents after I got saved as I finally recognized how much dissension I caused in their marriage. It was horrible. And if you look at your own life, strife is usually because of a third party. That's why the Bible says if you've been offended by someone in Matthew 18, you're to go to him and him alone and work it out. Talk about it. You're not to talk 
You're, you're to talk to the person. You're not to talk about the person. And God can use that to resolve, especially in your marriages. Strife is a part of life. And let me just say this in Abram's life. Because if you see, Lot, you know, Abram says, hey, look, we don't want any strife. In verse 9, the whole land's before you. Just choose something. You choose, and I'll choose the opposite. Just we need to separate, and, and you choose first, Lot. Now, Lot, he chooses. He chooses the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to ruin his family. It's going to ruin his legacy. It's going to ruin his effectiveness. And yet, Abram did, just said, okay, you choose, and I'll choose the other way. We, we can't have this anymore. And I want to add one more thing before we move on. And that is sometimes God uses the strife in your life to get your attention, to, to cause you to cry out in prayer. It's sometimes God uses strife to, to cause humility and brokenness in your life. Other times God uses strife to remove someone out of your life. You see, in order to, for Abram to receive the promise we're going to read in a moment, he needed to have Lot removed from his life. It, that had to happen first. That's why we started. You go, Ed, where's this with Sarah and Abram? We're talking all about Lot. Well, I want to show you something. I want you to realize this. Sometimes there has to be a removal of someone out of our lives before we're able to move forward in faith. And God uses strife here to separate. It does not, it's not permanent. It's not a permanent separation because when Lot gets in trouble, Abram's going to go save him. So it's not permanent, but in order, sometimes in our lives, we have to let go in order to lay hold of. We need to let go of. You know, in this case, Lot is, he loves the world more than he loves God, and it's affecting Abram. It's causing strife. Sometimes it's a, just a believer that just really doesn't, they, they love the world more than they love you. They love the world more than they love God. And God says, look, I'm going to use strife to separate you for a season, I'm going to use strife to get you to myself because the Bible tells us to separate ourselves. But I'm telling you, most of the time we don't like making that decision. Most of the time we don't want to make that decision. So what will God do? He'll use circumstances. He'll use strife to make that decision for us. Could be that, it, that it's not maybe a believer that's kind of backslidden that's affecting you. It could be an unbeliever. And God's using strife to get your attention and separate you for a season. Oh, it's not that you shouldn't have any unbelieving friends and pull yourself out of the world. Absolutely not. We're building bridges to a lost world. But in those close, tight relationships, God could be using strife to separate you from people so that you can hear and enjoy the blessings of God and receive fresh new promises so you can move forward by faith. Remember, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. In 2 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And there might be people in your life right now that are hurting you, not helping you. Taking, but not giving. Draining, but not developing. And they're sapping you of your spiritual strength and effectiveness. Those that don't encourage you, but discourage you. Those that don't help you, but tear you down. They don't build you up, but cut you out. They, you need to separate from them so you can hear the voice of the Lord. Because that's exactly what happens in verse 14. It says, The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from this place where you are, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. And all the land that you see I'll give to you and your descendants forever. By the way, the descendants that are more than the sand of the seashore. I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So if a man could number the dust, then your descendants could also be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I'll give it to you. And then Abram moved his tent, went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and he built an altar there to the Lord. There needed to be this separation before the promise came. And in... in life, you just need to expect conflict and division. In this church, you just need to expect it. You might come to a church and go, well, you know what? The, 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 coming into a church gathering, I'm not going to experience any difficulties, any, but we're not in heaven yet. We might get a taste of heaven, but we're not in heaven yet. Here you will experience all of the difficulties of the earth, of being a part of the world. And so let me give you a few things, if you're taking notes, let me give you a few things to consider when it comes to strife where we can avoid strife and we can avoid making it worse, but just a few things. The first thing is humility. When you humble yourself, strife ceases. 
It stops. That's what Abram did. Abram said, I know what's going on. I, I know the strife, but you know what, Lot? Pick somewhere. Whatever you want. You can look wherever you want. It's yours. He was the elder. This is something he should have done. He could have said, I'm taking the good ground. Lot, you take whatever. But he humbled himself. You'd be surprised the power of humility. Secondly, when it comes to strife, I want you to remember that it happens. Don't be surprised. Sometimes you're the cause of strife. We think of strife someone else, but sometimes you're the cause. Sometimes it's your flesh. Sometimes it's your inability to obey. Sometimes it's me. Sometimes I cause stress as a, as a human, as a fellow believer. And I need to remember it's there and that I can be a part of it. Like I could be the cause of it. It's not just them, it's us. We're a family. We're the family of God. We're the body of Christ. And so no, don't be surprised when it happens. Thirdly, it's important to put on the mind of Christ. And you say, Ed, what do you mean? Well, you need to think of things the way Jesus thought of things. And one of the ways that really encourages me is how Jesus, he always did the Father's will. What's going to bring the most glory to God? Think about what that would do for everything in your life besides strife. How it would help how you post and how you talk and how you write emails and how you treat people at work and how you serve your neighbor just to glorify God and build the kingdom. And then finally, or excuse me, number four, emphasize what's important. If you do have a conversation with someone to try to resolve things, just make sure you talk about what's important. Emphasize the main things. Don't get all personal and and uh, don't, you know, I, I, sometimes we'll try to resolve something, but we'll place all kinds of burdens on the other person. And you might even use this phrase, be careful when you use this phrase, when you say to someone, you made me feel. Well, actually, nobody makes you feel anything. Your feelings are a response to someone's actions. So when you're talking about some sin or issue, it's not you made me feel. You want to focus on the words you said were wrong. The actions you took were not what I see in the Bible. But how you feel is not someone else's responsibility. You guys with me so far? Say amen at home. Say it out loud. Even the kids with me. We often make things worse when we lay burdens on people that actually aren't the issue. Lot gets to choose. He moves on. We get the we get the promise of God. We see God interacting with, with Abraham. Lift up your eyes. Check this out. Why? Because they have a relationship. And then there's Sarah. And notice in chapter 18 of Genesis, this is so cool. Like chapter 18 now, there's this visitation, it says in verse 2, of three men. They come to deliver a promise. Many believe that one of these men is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, which is great according to verse 3. And then it says in verse 9, it says, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, this is Abram talking, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, which we already know. Sarah's 90, Abraham's in his hundreds. Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, in the promise of God, what does Sarah do? Laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why is, did, I, did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Is anything, if you don't have this marked already, you need to in verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? So let, answer this out loud, whether you're here or watching online. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, absolutely not. And I know you have a lot of hard things in your life right now. And I know you have a lot of impossibilities. I know we don't have this exaggerated example like Sarah where she's 90 years old. Well, you know, the promise came earlier than that, that she would have a baby when she was past age. And it, obviously that's not the promise to us, but I wonder what impossibility I can't help, when I hear that word impossible, think of a situation that's absolutely impossible in my life. It cannot be solved by humans at all. It can't be resolved by logic. It can't be resolved by human, uh, by common sense. It can't be resolved by reasoning. It can't be resolved by begging. It can't be resolved by any other means than God interven intervening 
And he's allowed that into my life for the last seven years and more. It, it is impossible. And we've tried in human ways, and it doesn't work. Only God's going to be able to solve it. And I wonder what impossibility. You have a situation with your son right now, with your daughter. It, it isn't going to be your words. It's going to be your love. It's impossible. Only God can make this work. Only God can bring encouragement. Only God can help. And that's where they're at. They have a promise, but only God can do it. But then if only God can do it, is anything too hard for God? No. No, nothing's too hard for God. At the appointed time, he says in verse 14, I'll return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. And by the way, you know how you keep things inside. You know how you have an inside voice. You know how if you laugh, you might chuckle. You might be cynical inside. We may not know, but God knows. <laughs> God knows. Everything's revealed. So it's not okay just to keep things in. It's better to repent and release things. But let's come back to Hebrews 11 as we wind down here. How is Sarah remembered? She's a la she laughed. She lied and she doubted God. Genesis. She laughed, she lied, and she doubted God. And how is she remembered in verse 11? By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and bore a child because she judged him faithful who had promised. Remember, this is the hall of faith and not the hall of failure. And you read Sarah, you might have known the scripture already in Genesis and go, by faith? What do you mean? She's a liar. She, she's a denier of God. She doubts God. She doesn't believe God's promises. She hides in the tent and laughs at God by faith. And haven't you found this to be true? There's always somebody to come along and remind you of your past. It's true. All of it's true. Sarah had faith and had a baby in 90 years old. She also had time of doubting. She also had an episode of lying. She also had issues with her laughter and not being honest about it and laughing at the promises of God. She had the kid. Remember what they name him? Isaac. What does his name mean in Hebrew? Laughter. Because it was funny. The whole thing was funny. Didn't you get to a place sometimes in your life you just look back and go, man, Lord, I chose to go the hard way. I could have gone the easy way, but I went the hard way. And you just got to laugh and go, oh, Lord, I need a sense of humor. I want to go the easy way. Because you can go the easy way, you can go the hard way. You choose. And here we are. We have faith of Sarah. She believed God. She believed her husband. She doubted. She lied. She struggled. She wondered. She had a baby according to the promises of God. Because not even your weaknesses will hold back the promises of God. And she made it to the hall of faith. Even though, even though she didn't see the fullness of the promise to Abraham, Mark these words in verse 13. They all died in faith. And you know, if you and I are not raptured, if we're not the generation, if it's not our generation that's raptured, all of us will die in faith too as believers. We'll do the same thing because we won't see the fulfillment of every promise that God has ever given to us. We'll die in faith. And while we walk on this earth, we need to take hold of this. We need to acknowledge that we've seen the promises of God. I, I mark these words. Promises, in verse 13, seen, assured, embraced, and confessed. That's the pathway of faith. They are seen, assured, embraced, and confessed. As we live not on this world, but for that heavenly home that's to come. We get really excited about the heavenly home. We've talked about it in these studies because that, that was part of what motivated Abraham. He looked for that home. He looked for that heavenly scene. He had the eternal perspective in mind. He was able to, he was able to navigate through this world knowing that this world is not his, at the end. He's a sojourner, and it's very encouraging. And as you and I go through, I know we get so excited about that glorious place of rest finally in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, worshiping him, re reunited with our loved ones, our parents, our siblings, for some our kids, reunited in heaven for all of eternity. We look forward to that. We have an inheritance 
a treasure it is for you and I to walk by the Holy Spirit because life on earth comes with so many difficulties and so many sorrows and so many setbacks and pain and disappointment. All of these, what? They just make heaven so much more attractive. It's like, and you know, we're often accused of, oh, you're just escapist. No, not at all. I just have hope. I have hope that there's a better day coming. I have hope of the promises of God being fulfilled. I have hope that his word is true beginning to end. I don't want to escape. I want to be faithful while I'm here. I mean, I guess in one way I do want to escape pain and difficulties, but I'm learning that ain't going to happen. God's going to use it in my life. That even the worst days in my life will become the best days when God has redeemed them in my life. And so in some respects, sure, I would love to escape difficulties, but as I look at the world today and I look what we're involved in, I want to remind you, church, that we were born for this. Our birth date is such where we to, are to be on the planet Earth today in this environment with these challenges, with these setbacks. We were born for this. You were born for this. You were born again for this. And, and I know that there's this... Uh, concern of isolation and having to pull back, but it's not God's will for believers to be isolated from this world. It's God's will that we infiltrate this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his desire. The solution to the problems is not to isolate ourselves. The solution to the problem is to find open doors, to learn from Sarah, to learn from Abraham, to make that daily conscious decision to look forward and not backward. Did you, I hope you didn't miss that. It says in uh, verse 15 that if they would have uh, looked backwards, they might have gone back. Do you notice that? It says, truly, if they called to mind what country they came from, then they would have had opportunity to return. We've got to learn to look forward. It's the upward call of Christ and call of God in Christ Jesus. It is forgetting those things that are behind. It's into faith we go following God. And Sarah shows us, yeah, she's not perfect. She, she made mistakes. Abraham made mistakes. She made, he made huge mistakes with his wife that would cause any woman to doubt him, any woman to doubt her husband. But how does she go down in Hebrews? A woman of faith. It's the same thing going to happen in your life. You're going to be that woman of faith, ladies, by taking all the circumstances into account as you choose to obey God. And you're going to become that man of faith, guys, as you choose to follow God, no matter your failures, moving forward. The world needs you. The world needs you. And you need the world. And you're like, man, Ed, I need the world like a root canal. Like, yeah, I really need the world. I want to go to heaven. And who likes root canals? I don't like root canals personally. However, I like the result. I needed one. I got one. Dennis did their thing. And, and now I know that that's going to be a place of healing and no longer a source of pain in my life. Sometimes you need a root canal. <laughs> and you always need the world. And, and think about it this way. You can exchange world, the world system and the people in this world, with family. Because you were born into the family you're in right now. Or adopted in like I was. And you can't choose your family. God chose your family for you. You can even exchange world family with church family. God chose your church family. You didn't choose it. Now, I know there's some discussion of why I was visiting churches and checking out churches. Sure. But if you're a real believer, God led you to this church or that church. God led you. It's his choice. The church you want to find is the one God chose for you, not the one that you chose. Well, I like this and I like that. <clears throat> I like all these things. Great. But does God like it? Is that where God wants you? Because when you have that confidence, you get through anything. And you exchange, you need the world, the world needs you. You need your family, your family needs you. You need your church family, your church family needs you. It all fits. Why do we need the world? Why do we need the family? Because God uses the world, the family, the church family to train us. <laughs> the difficulties train you. The hardships train you. The joys, you know, you get a taste of heaven. We're worshiping and exciting and it's awesome. And then, and then that's a taste of heaven but also you go through the difficulties and the hardships and you get through them. You need the world, the world needs you. What does the world need you? Because you're the salt and the light. You're able to pause when you're there at the drive through window of McDonald's and the person, the gal that's taking your money, you're talking about the current events, 
and she says, you know, I'm really scared right now. And you pause there and you say, well, can I pray for you right here? You there and me in my car, I want to pray for you. Because I know it's a scary time and it's an uncertain time. But I want you to know I'm a little less scared than you. Well, why? Because I have a relationship with the one true God. And by faith, we'll get through this. By faith, we can look back, can't we? I can look back in my life and been through some really heavy duty stuff. And I just shared that with you in the past tense, didn't I? I've been through. Why have I been through? Because God got me through. And it's past. And God's going to do the same thing in our lives. By faith, Sarah receives strength. And the same is true for you and me. So Father, thank you for the privilege of, of studying Sarah and Abraham, of growing in our understanding of this topic of faith, especially in the times in which we live and the challenges that we face and the fears and anxieties that come our way. They're real. They're not perceived. We have challenges and we have temptations to fear and temptations to falter. And we're just asking you to forgive us, God, and give us the strength that we need to be pillars in our community, to be pillars in our workplace, to be pillars in our home. God, I pray for the men of our church would rise up and be the men you've called them to be. That even if they come to, you, to their wives or to their kids, maybe a single dad, and they come to their families, they go, look, I think God's speaking that, the, that everyone would say, all right, I trust you. And we'd be able to move forward in faith. We'd be able to trust one another with a faith that only comes from you. And God, I pray for those listening in right now that have never given their life to Jesus Christ, that today would be the day. And if you're listening to me right now and you've never received the forgiveness of your sins, then I want to invite you to ask God to forgive you. This is the time. Yes, in the midst of fear, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of difficulty, this is the time. You can pray in front of your TV. You can pray in front of your radio. You can pray with a phone in your hand and AirPods in your ears. God knows you and sees you and he loves you and he cares for you and he wants you to enter in. You could pray right in your prison cell or in your hospital bed or in your car or in this room or downstairs in front of a TV and you can ask God to forgive you. Pray to God and repeat after me and God will hear this prayer. You can say, God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, and I believe he rose again from the dead to save me and my soul. And I dedicate my life to following you from this day forward. And I'm asking you, God, to give me the strength to do that. And give me the strength to turn away from my sins and renounce them and repent from them so I can live a new life that pleases you. And Father, anyone, anywhere that would cry out to you, I know you hear them. And I pray that they would receive newness of life, that it would be a real spiritual transaction today in their lives in the midst of fear. And I pray for our country and I pray, God, for our church. I know even not even being able to come and worship together has troubled many people and I pray for that troubling heart it's a difficult season in our world today but God we want to respond in faith and strength and power so help us to do that in Jesus name amen amen